Welcome, everybody. My name is Lou Bradley, and I'm a fairly well known in Chandler as one of the veterans here that gets involved in everything for veterans, including our field of honor. And if you got your checkbooks with us, we can uh, we can share you some money so we can get that memorial completed. Anyway, I was born on Mother's Day in 1933. My mother never let me forget it. Every time Mother's Day was coming up, you know what you did to me? And I'd say, well, hell, why'd you have a headache? <laughs> but that lasted not because, uh, she always got on me about it because that was her aunt and uncle's 50th wedding anniversary and she missed a week long party. We lived in uh, Dupo, Illinois, which was nothing but a Missouri Pacific switching station close to the Mississippi River, surrounded by farms probably a population of about 300 total, all working for the railroad. My father went into the Army in World War II, and because my mother went to work in St. Louis, I spent a few months with one of her sisters and then several years with her aunt who had a boarding house for kids. When my father got out, he bought a home in St. Louis. I spent my time as a paper boy delivering a route in the evening and as a caddy at a country club, a private country club called Meadowbrook in Overland, Missouri. And I caddied very steadily for a guy named Carl Paul who owned all the big movie theaters in St. Louis. My first duty was go to the clubhouse, get him six Anthony and Cleopatra cigars. I always ended up with one when we, when we were done. And normally I smoked that at the course before I went home. One day I didn't. I waited till I got off the streetcar, I lit it up. I was still smoking it when I came in the house. And my mother hates the smell of cigars. So she got all over me for smoking the cigar. Not that I was smoking, but because she didn't like the smell. Being a wise ass 16 year old, Look, Mom, I pay you room and board. I buy my books. I buy my clothes. I should be able to smoke a cigar that my golfer gave me. My dad come in and decked me, and that was about the uh, umpteenth time that he did that. I got up, hit him. He put his hand in his face, come up with a drop of blood, and he said, out. This was in uh, February of 1950. So being just a couple of months from my 17th birthday, I went to live with a friend of mine, a school friend whose brother, his name was Jimmy Cooper. He was a World War II Marine. He had a restaurant called Gremlin Inn, which was right around the corner from a fisher body plant. So he served lunch to the day shift and the night shift. And I stayed in the back of the restaurant was able to help him during the day and hear all of his World War II stories about the Marines. So that kind of convinced me, well, why not be one of the few, the proud, the greatest fighting force on Mother Earth? On my 17th birthday, I went down and joined. Took the papers home, my parents signed them, and I was off for the real boot camp, Paris Island. When I got out of boot camp, had to stay in casual company for a week until I had an assignment. They made me a radio man. They sent me to Cherry Point, North Carolina. And I was in VMF 223, which was a Panther Jet Squadron. I heard, uh, well, well, the Korean War, of course, started when I was in boot camp. And we were out just at the end of the day doing our exercises and running and all of that and our silent drills. And our drill instructors told us that the North Koreans had invaded South Korea. Everybody says, where the hell's Korea? Our answer, I don't know. It's in Asia somewhere. But anyway, uh, we had a squadron of Corsairs that was scheduled to be, to be deployed to Korea, and I tried to transfer into that because all I was doing was pulling ARC-1 units out of these F-9 airplanes correcting the problem by changing a simple crystal in them, depending upon what the problem was. And I was spending most of my time with the mechanics. When I went to Korea, I first had to go to Santa Ana. I drove from North Carolina, New Bern, North Carolina, in a 
47 Studebaker that I had bought from a friend. Drove from there, leaving there early on a Saturday afternoon. Ended up in Phoenix where my folks had moved to because they were tired of shoveling snow. And then I drove that on over to El Toro. I gave it to my brother who was in the Navy. And that's the last I ever saw of it. Went to El Toro and from El Toro, then got on the ship, went over to Yokosuka. My first taste of sake as we got on the train from Yokosuka to Itami Air Base, which ended up being the Osaka National Airport. But we uh, bought, like everybody else, on the train platform, we got sake, and he says, well, boy, this kerosene tastes pretty good. <laughs> but from uh, Itami, I was airlifted then over to Pyeongtaek, which we designate K6. Pyeongtaek is on the coast just west of Seoul. Well, being a radio man, and then they put me in a MAMS-12, which is a Marine Air Maintenance Squadron. My only duties was in a radio shop, and I, had, I knew nothing about the inside of a radio. So I spent all of my time with the mechanics. The first winter in 52, I spent all night running up airplanes so that the uh, oil wouldn't freeze. We'd start, we had three squadrons there. We had two Corsair squadrons and one AD-4 squadron. It was VMF 212, 312, and 323. We were issued the new thermo boots. So in the mornings, after running those engines up every night, when I take off those boots to change my wet, change my wet socks, the whole bottom of my feet were red. It looked like I'd been sitting on iron coals or something. As I spent most of the time with the mechanics and helping them, we lost our HO3S air air rescue, air sea rescue crew chief. The, air, the HO3S, we had a pilot and then a crew, the crew of one. So I volunteered to take his job. Well, shortly before this happened, I was on mess duty. I had two jobs. At nighttime, I made ice cream. All the cooks hated me because I stole all of their canned fruit to make ice cream, tutti frutti, pineapple, <laughs> peach ice cream, all of that. And my other job was to take a six by in the morning out to the gate and pick up the workers for the mess hall and then in the evening to take them out. During this time, we just got some professional MPs. Up until we got them, MP was just temporary duty for us. On a rainy evening, taking them out to the gate, I had to go outside the gate in order to turn the six by around and come back in. We had one little boy, I guess he was 10 or 12 years old, that we all loved. He worked in the mess hall. And I knew he had a mile or more to walk home, so I gave him my poncho to keep dry on the way home. This MP gave me hell because I gave away government property. And I tried to explain to him, look, this is a good kid. He'll bring this poncho back tomorrow. And I was taking so much static from him, I just ended up and I cold cocked him. And just as he was getting up, the roving patrol come in the gate. They put me in their Jeep, took me to the brig because I was absent without authority. I was outside the gate. <laughs> The next morning, I had to go to our new company commander, who was a Major Wilson, and he took my staff sergeant warrant. He says, here, you made staff sergeant. Ripped it up, and he says, you are now a corporal. <laughs> so that was uh, demotion number one. Right after that is when we lost our, our, our helicopter crew chief, and I volunteered to do that, and they, they said, well, okay, here's a screw up. We'll put you on it. So I took care of the helicopter after that, and uh, every time we had a full sortie 
we had to be in the air, and when they came back from their mission, we had to be in the air just in case. And any of them that didn't return, we went after. One of the gruesome things that I saw, we had a Sabre jet who had landed, or had crashed in a farmhouse maybe 10, 12 miles away. We went in to get, to recover him. The pilot was dead, so we got his body out. Inside this house was what appeared to be a grandfather that was decapitated. And there was a young girl, maybe 12, 14, 15 years old, that was pinned under the, the wing of the airplane. And she had almost had one leg sheared off. So we loaded her and the dead pilot up, brought him back to the base, and they, our medics worked on her and then took her by truck to a hospital in Seoul. The other scary thing that I had, I thought I wouldn't live. We had a pilot in the water that could not get out in his sling. I don't know why, because my cartridge belt, I had a 45 on each hip, and I always had my M1 in, in the airplane. He couldn't get in the sling, and I went down. I had a couple of pieces of rope about 14 inches long that you'd use for calf tying. So I got him in a sling and tied his hands to it so the pilot could raise him up. And I knew at that time I had about nine minutes before I was an icicle. Thankfully, an Air Force helicopter came over just a couple of minutes later, and I was able to get in his sling. After uh, all of this stuff, I kept on re-upping. Our tour was nine months, so I took another nine months. I went over in May of 52. In November of 53, after the ceasefire and everything, they moved me to Itami, and they made me a crew chief of a jet engine repair crew. We still had airplanes going back and forth. One of the things I remember very well there, we had what we call a CS inspector. I took him out one day to a Panther jet that we had removed the engine in and it still had it in the shop and I says, okay, this airplane's ready to go back to Korea. So he looks it over and everything and he signed it off. So I took the papers into our leading chief and I says, look at this. Now go out and look at that airplane. He went out and noticed that the airplane didn't have an engine in it. So that was the end of that inspector's job. After I came back, my enlistment was up. Come back to Treasure Island on the Weagle. They gave me mess duty again. My job there was down in the very bottom of the ship taking these little half pint containers of milk out and trying to make them into a pyramid so that they would thaw out by breakfast time. I'd get two or three stories high, we'd hit a swale and they're all down. That was an all night job. <laughs> Got into Treasure Island and uh, I was interviewed, asked to re-enlist and I says, uh, blank you, I'm tired of being shot at, <laughs> I'm going. Right after I got out, my folks, had, as I said, my folks had moved to Phoenix. They were in South Phoenix at 1610 West Weir, down close to 19th Avenue and Broadway. They stayed with them for a couple of weeks, and one of their neighbors asked me if I was looking for a job. I said, sure, got to do something. So I went to work for Garrett Air Research. And dummy, I started out in assembly line and I went to inspector, overhaul inspection and then a quality control engineer. I was a quality control engineer for all the turbo machinery. And we made this turboprop engine and those went into production. I took that through development and FAA qualification test and all of that certification test. And along comes the Vietnam War. I had to go over, Air America was getting airplanes that had our engine. I had to go over on a problem into Vietnam and I come back and I says, hey, I just got transferred into field service. And I said, we need somebody over there. I said, well, we don't have any field service engineers that want to go. He says, hell, I'll go. 
I went up to Bethany, Oklahoma to the Aero Commander facility to help our field service guy there. Got a call on Thursday. And he says, are you serious about going overseas? I said, sure, why not? Can you go Monday? He says, sure. Can I come home tomorrow and pack up? Yeah, okay, get back to Phoenix. So I walked in Monday. I was handed the airplane tickets and I was off. I went first to Taiwan, which is the Air America main maintenance base. And they did some aircraft conversions there of the C-45 into what they call the Bopar, going from a reciprocated engine to twin turboprop engines and tricycle landing gears. And I spent a total of 28 years back over there. Many of them, I had a couple of airplanes to take care of in Korea. One was their equivalent of our RFAA, who had an aero commander. There was another aero commander that did air mapping for Korean Airlines. The KCAB crashed theirs. But then uh, Korean Airlines got a, a Cherokee 400, and they did that for pilot training down at uh, Jeju Island. And that was the last one I had to take care of over there. But the first time I was back was in 66. I couldn't believe how Seoul had rebuilt from the rubble that I'd seen when we would get a, a couple of days leave and go to Seoul. We always made a stop to kind of refresh ourselves and, and have a little hanky-panky and a little booze before we'd go into Seoul. And there was nothing to do in Seoul except look at all the rubble. But you, you will never believe it to what Seoul is today. The last time I was there was on a revisit program, looking down from the bus off of the expressway, 30-story high apartment buildings. And when we went back on that revisit, we were treated like kings. We were really treated like kings, and I, I built a reputation. I was one of the First one's off the bus, and our tour guide was helping everybody off, and I'm, I'm jumping off the steps amongst the first dozen going out, and I'm walking backwards or skipping, saying, come on, you old farts, keep up. And we came out of the War Memorial when we visited that. There was a ramp going down, and I'm, going, I'm the first one going down the ramp, and the tour guide says, slow down. I said, hell, this is slow for me. <laughs> everybody else was a good 30 yards behind me. Several of the really important stops was a reenactment of the Inchon Landing, in which every one of us had an escort, which were, I'd say, middle school girls in sailor uniforms. And we also had a reenactment of the Naktong River Battle. And we all had escorts there. And at the, right at the end of that, reenactment was really, really sad because you had one, you, know, you had two brothers, one who fought for South Korea and one who was made to fight for North Korea. And the one that was made to fight for North Korea was dying. And his brother was there holding him. And the one says, they made me do it. I didn't have a choice. I'm going to add a little commentary about this picture. So I was with Mr. Bradley in Korea when we went in 2013. This is September. So this was a commemoration of what happened at the Pusan perimeter with the battles at Naktong River. This is really on the Naktong River. So we had just finished the reenactment, and these Korean uh, veterans, the Korean gentlemen there, came up mm -hmm. to Mr. Bradley and said to me in Korean, so of course I translated to Mr. Bradley, mm -hmm. he said, you are the brave Americans that saved us. And of course, that is so true. And I thought these two gentlemen were going to jump up and kiss <laughs> Mr. Bradley. <laughs> they were so happy to see him. They were so grateful. And they were just filled with tears. I don't know if you can see that, mm -hmm. but I think you were too, Mr. Bradley. And mm -hmm. so it was such a wonderful uh, expression of gratitude from those that fought uh, the same war. And of course, Korea is what it yep. is today because of all of our veterans who served in Korea. So I just wanted to kind of share that personal anecdote of what was said to Mr. Bradley, that you are the brave Americans that saved us. And so those were the words I still remember, and I hope mm -hmm. you will always remember that, Mr. Bradley. Oh, yes. Yes, I will. And this is one of the reasons 
why we were there. As she said, her parents were only about 10 years old. But this is why we fought. That's right. And when we see the, li the little orphanages over there and that, we know why we were there. Of course, when we went there, we say, well, we're fighting in a country we never heard of for a people we didn't know. But uh, the community here in the valley, the Korean community here really, really are very, very grateful and treat us good. They invite us, uh, we used to have a church ceremony up on 7th Street in Osborne. The Sunday closest to June the 25th, they feed us, they had some kekwadu uh, demonstrations and all of that. And we've had several other things. We've, we've been down at the uh, Heritage Center in the downtown Phoenix, posting colors, <laughs> having a ceremony, getting fed. And if you ever, uh, you know, if you aren't in good stead with your wife, never eat a lot of kimchi before you go home. <laughs> or you might be sleeping out in a doghouse. <laughs> All I can say is, I am damn proud, even though I was a wise ass. I think it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I went from a really wise 17-year-old, I grew up, and I grew up fast. I had a drill instructor at Paris Island, and one day coming back from the shower into the sleeping bay, I was just walking normally. He grabbed me, he put his two fingers down my skivvy shirt, twisted, and started pounding my head against the wall. And he says, look, you little feather merchant. I used to break horses, now I break men. All I could say is, yes, sir, Corporal Ryder. Yes, sir, I believe you, sir. <laughs> he says, from now on, you double time back. <laughs> and I did. Every day after that, while I was still in boot camp, after I took a shower, I was double timing back to the sleeping bay. At nighttime, when they say lights out, they mean lights out. Somebody talks, okay. Everybody grab your foot lockers. We're going for a little hike. So you're carrying your foot lockers, lockers walking around several square blocks and back again. <laughs> and that was not very enjoyable. Well, mm -hmm. thank you, Mr. Bradley. I really appreciate you sharing your story. And of course, Mr. Bradley will be uh, able to speak with you after the presentation as well. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Bradley. Thank you.